Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody enjoyed the welcome reception last night, had the opportunity to get some breakfast and continue to visit um, our wonderful exhibitors. And we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Um, just a few housekeeping notes before we kick the day off. Um, again, we, we are offering complimentary Wi-Fi in the entire meeting space area. The Wi-Fi code is kidneypatients18. Um, also, don't forget to visit our social media center, which is located in the Palm um, Court foyer area right here across from the registration center. We have some fun Florida props. Um, the social media center is sponsored by our partner, Dialysis Clinic Incorporated. So please take pictures, post them, tweet. Um, hashtag, the official hashtag for the meeting is hashtag kidneypatients18. So please tag us so everybody can see all the wonderful activities that went on this weekend. Um, so I will now um, welcome AKP's President Paul Conway up to uh, kick off the morning. Thanks, Diana. Um, yesterday morning, we kicked off our morning with uh, Diana Kleins, and I introduced her as our acting executive director. But if you could join me this morning, because uh, last night our board voted unanimously to name uh, Diana Kleins executive director of the American Association of Kidney Patients. <laughs> Thanks, Diana. Um, the other thing I just want to uh, point out here real quickly, yesterday we had a session that was done by Jim Myers uh, on our team. This is Jim right down here in the front, and also uh, Kevin Fowler, and that was on uh, social media. We also have Dave White, who's one of our experts on social media here. Um, hopefully, as you go through the session this morning and listen to this, you'll start asking the fundamental question of what's my role and how can I help? And I just want to hit a couple of things here real quick before I intro our speakers. Right here is a diagram, very quickly, of the major uh, elements of political communications over the past 100 years. And if you look down on the bottom row, these are the prominent tactics and methods that have been used over the past 20, 25 years. And you can start to see the evolution of the internet and email, online donations. 2008, you look at the efforts that President Obama used to win his election. It was the use of social media, really on the first uh, level of scale on a national campaign. At the bottom, you'll see a little thing that says big data, and what does that mean? There's a lot of stuff in the news right now, but essentially what we're talking about are insights into uh, who's using social media, how frequently they use it, and what platforms they use. By the time you got to 2016, and this is happening, this use of technology is happening at light speed. You see social media 2.0, earned media, which is what you can get into your local newspaper or on your local news station, and big data 2.0 which is pretty much insights into every single thing that you do online combined with consumer data, what you buy, where you shop, and that type of thing. This right now is the state of American political technology. Like it or not, this is how campaigns are fought and won years in advance of the election. And why does this matter? Because this is directly related to the technologies that are used in advocacy, including by AAKP. Two things that win for Kidney World. Uh, patients, and this is a fantastic uh, photo on the left of an effort that was put together by the American Society of Nephrology, and you'll hear from Rachel Meyer here shortly, um, of many different organizations that came together to go up on a Capitol Hill in a combined effort. This is over 100 congressional visits that were done in about eight hours. Absolutely fantastic work. And over on the right-hand side, it's kind of a symbol of the power that every single person here has in their hand to impact change. Quick study of social media. This was done by the Congressional Management Foundation in 2015. Uh, several of us that uh, work in politics had a role in this study. Just take a look at these points. Probably the most important one here is the last one as a preview to this session. Uh, the report said that posts can influence congressional decision making. So how many people here have an iPhone or a smartphone? Thank you. How many people here uh, are connected to AAKP on Twitter or Facebook. Change that up for all of those who are, who are not, okay? You gotta follow us. And then ask yourselves, how many people do I know and are, am I telling them, if you're comfortable, about what you're doing to advocate for kidney disease? And if you're not doing it, 
please join us. It's very easy to do, but the power to make a difference is literally in your hands. So these are the goals to be an active AKP member. It's not that much. You can do it from your chair, you can do it from your home, you can do it from your dialysis center. You can do it while you're waiting in line at the doctor's office. Um, number five here, it says share intelligence with AAKP. And what do I mean by that? It means if you have a relationship with a congressional member, if you go to a farmer's market and you see somebody uh, that you know that's your elected representative, you should let AAKP know that because maybe you need talking points. Maybe you need to talk about what's going on in some of the legislation that's going to be talked about today and you buttonhole somebody. Literally last night we had an email from somebody who had gone to a local event. They were a prominent um, advocate with a national organization and they went and they met with a congresswoman and they asked her, will you support a piece of legislation? And she said, yes. We've been in and out of that congressional office for several months and haven't gotten the commitment from the staff. At a local event, the commitment was yes. But when you do that, we need to know about it because it helps us. And again, uh, talk to Jim Myers, Kevin Fowler, Dave White. They'll get you connected. Uh, I understand the concepts, but I'm a, not a technical person. <laughs> um, again, uh, for today, it's called Under the Dome. We started this session several years ago to better connect you with what's happening in Washington, D.C. So there are a lot of things that are said about Washington. You know, it's a swamp. Nothing ever happens. Um, nothing ever gets done. My voice isn't heard. And what we're going to tell you this morning is, one, that's not true. And two, you need to understand that the history of AAKP is actually rooted in the United States Congress. As I said yesterday, six patients in Kings County Hospital got together and got the end-stage renal disease legislation passed within four years and signed by the president by 1973. It's saved a million lives. Those folks back then weren't cynics. That was also a pretty interesting time of a lot of contention. But it happened and it got done. This morning, you're going to hear from two experts uh, that we brought in, joined by our vice president uh, and chair of public policy, Richard Knight. And these folks are absolutely tremendous. Uh, they know everything that goes on. They're honorable. And uh, we work quite well together. Um, our first speaker will be uh, Peggy Tai, and I always mispronounce her name, but I got it right this morning. Thanks, Peggy. <laughs> uh, Peggy's an expert on healthcare issues, and she translates them into action. She's a principal at Powers Law Firm in Washington, D.C., and she's considered a true specialist on the nuances of legislation and how to move legislation both inside the Congress, in the House and in, in the Senate, and also through national coalitions and groups like ours. Um, she has a very long history on issues such as uh, Medicare, the Affordable Care Act, um, long-term acute care, hospital care. Um, her prior experience is in healthcare lobbying um, with the American Medical Association and the Health Insurance Association of America. And I first actually came to know Peggy indirectly because she was phenomenal in her efforts in rebuilding the city of New Orleans and making certain that the hospital and the care systems in New Orleans had the resources they need to stand back up their operations quickly and start taking care of people. And for that, uh, she's rather legendary for the amount of money that she got into uh, New Orleans and Louisiana in a very short period of time. <laughs> On the radar screen, Peggy. <laughs> uh, our next speaker uh, after Peggy will be Rachel Meyer. And uh, Rachel is the uh, director of uh, policy and government for the American uh, Society of Nephrology, ASN. Yesterday, we gave uh, Todd, the executive director, our president's award. Rachel works on that team as the director. She's the primary responsibility for policy in the Congress and under the dome. She's absolutely fantastic. She tracks all the details. She works on the language. She comes to us proactively, gets patient insights, and makes certain that that fine mix of medical expert it, uh, it, insights and advice is married up with patient input. And she honors the principle of no surprises consistently. So wherever ASN is on the Hill and on legislation, it's why you see so many joint letters from us. That's the work um, that Rachel's doing to make certain that the patient voice is right alongside the doctor's voice. Absolutely fantastic. She has prior experience on Capitol Hill. Uh, she's been very active on legislation, the HOPE Act that allowed uh, HIV to HIV organ transplant, uh, health quality issues, the ESCOs, many different issues like that. Um, and she worked for Ken Salazar, uh, the Democrat uh, from Colorado. She has tremendous uh, insights. Uh, she'll be joined by Richard Knight. And uh, everybody knows Richard. What people often don't um, appreciate about Richard is he spent quite a few years on Capitol Hill um, for a congressman in the House. 
He was the liaison to the Congressional Black Caucus. He's an expert on legislative process. Uh, his committee that he worked with uh, for the congressman was small business. So he lives at an interesting intersection of policy, which is health care, the impact on individuals, and their ability to stay employed, and how you get legislation passed. The three of them are absolutely fantastic. So I'll go ahead and ask everybody to come on up, and uh, we'll have uh, Peggy uh, go first. Thank you very much. Oh, my apologies, Richard will lead first. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out. And um, we're going to have an exciting session, especially when we get to Rachel and Peggy. But um, before we do that, I want to run through a couple of slides to make certain that we put this in context. We talk about Hill days, but there's a lot of work that's done before the Hill days. Obviously, we have people come up. Great when we can hit a number of congressional senatorial offices. But then there's a lot of work that's done after that. And as part of the team, because each and every one of you are part of the team, I just want to put a few things in context to see how we can be even more <coughs> effective. Heard a lot of people talk yesterday. And I think we can all agree that if certain things are going to happen, we're going to have to make it happen. So let's begin here. <clears throat> Session under the dome. Again, want to point out we're bipartisan in our approach, nonpartisan in our operations. The main thing I want to point out here is that when there's a change from one party to another, we remain unaffected. We work with both parties because, regardless of how we, what we feel or what we think, our charge is to go up there, represent and advocate for the patient community. That's always our focus. So our targets, Senate, House, but we also work with the Kidney Caucus. We work with the Congressional Black Caucus. We work with the Hispanic Caucus, any of the other organizations that we think are relevant and can have an impact on what we're trying to get done. Um, We've, show, we've seen this slide many times, but I wanted to focus on, from a mission perspective and what we're talking about today, our main charge, advocate. Advocate, advocate, advocate. And we will always defend patient choices. Many people have asked me, well, Richard, do you have a set policy on different legislation, on different issues that we can learn? We don't. We encourage people to understand what our principles are. And as one doctor said to me, Richard, it's not that simple. I said, yes, it is. What is going to have the best impact on patient outcomes? And that's the path we're going to take. So I just want to, for us to focus on what our principles are and what our mission is. And that's how we operate. A little background, how our advocacy has grown in the past few years under the, the leadership and direction of Paul. You can see that our footprint on the Hill and our activities on the Hill has increased substantially. And we're up to 250 so far this year. And we still have several months to go. So we're looking forward to even more activity. <clears throat> and this to, to um, expand on that for 2018. So it's uh, um, a lot of activity going on. We work with Rachel, Peggy, their organizations. We appreciate the opportunity to do that. I think we make a very good team together, and we're able to get our points, our points across that much, uh, that much better. So many of you have visited us and joined us up on Capitol Hill, and we invite you to join us whenever you get the opportunity. This is a picture of us. We were recently at the White House. Um, that happens to be Congressman Burgess there, who's worked with us on some legislation and um, the rest of the team. And that was certainly a, uh, 
we were just so proud to be there at the White House as the president announced um, his new policy dealing with um, getting the price of drugs lowered. This was another White House meeting that we attended, and we were there with the um, we were there at the White House to meet um, Lance Leggett, who's the Deputy uh, Director of Domestic Policy. In this case, we were visiting with the Paper Coalition, or protecting access to pain relief. You know, as renal patients, we have to stay away from the NSAIDs. We have to deal with s metaphenes and we want to make certain that those products are available to us over the counter. So these are the type of, where we roll up the sleeves and get involved in these things. Um, and again, Paul is the chairperson of the steering committee that heads this up. So that's part of our strategy also, not just to join, but to get in leadership positions in many of these organizations. We had the occasion to um, visit Secretary Azar, Secretary of HHS. Normally you have a five or 10 minute visit. I think that we were there for about an hour. Um, we connected with him because we did not know it at the time, but his father had a transplant. And again, we were talking about the high price of drugs, and we were specifically speaking on the subject of immunosuppressive medication. So that's something that we will be revisiting, and we look forward to doing what we can to help increase the availability of that drug. And finally, as I said, we work with all the administration, and this is a picture of us. I believe this is June of 2016 when we had the occasion to attend the, um, I believe that was the Organ Transplant Summit. Yeah, I think that's close enough. Um, <laughs> we had the occasion to visit that, and um, you know, we were certainly um, honored to be, to have a presence there. So again, these are just some of the activities in which we've been involved. And again, going back to one of the things that we always like to talk about is choosing allies and assessing risk. So these are principles that I want that I want us to understand. Sometimes it may not make sense for us to work with the organization because it could be counter to or discredit our, mi our mission. It doesn't make somebody bad or good, but we want to do things with individuals who are aligned with how we approach things. You'll find that when something comes out that we don't like, we're not throwing spitballs or we're not jumping up and down. We have a tendency to go into the room and have the discussion. So I just want to give you a little bit of backdrop and an overview. Don't forget to post. I want to give you a little bit of backdrop and overview as to how we operate. And now I'm going to turn to the experts. Who really noticed? Peggy, are you first? Right, yeah. Do you want to click? Yeah. Do you want to flip the slides, and I'll just stay here. <laughs> yeah, look, I'm giving him projects. Isn't that me? I'm here to serve. <laughs> okay. Whatever you need. All right, I'll go up. You can you can just hand that to her. I, you can oh, do us in there if you want. Yeah, I think. Yeah. You don't have to aim it. I'm in. so short. It doesn't matter if I stand up. So. Okay. Well, let's sit. Let's make this comfortable. So. Um, so when Rachel and I, uh, Peggy Ty, yes, I'm a lobbyist, but I'm kind of a nice person too. <laughs> Um, and I love working with you all, advocates, uh, Patrick G, Mary, a whole bunch of you floating around, I, uh, Ed Hickey, all great people. <laughs> working with Paul and um, Richard on Capitol Hill has been such a delight for me. Um, I don't have the personal experience that you have, but I am an advocate. So I work with the American Society of Transplant Surgeons. And when the surgeons go in and talk about what they need on Capitol Hill or what they don't like on Capitol Hill, it's just the surgeon's voice. And I'm trained and I'm doing the surgeon's voice. What makes me so much more powerful and strong is to have a patient by my side. Somebody who really talks about what it means from a patient's perspective, not just the guy with the scalpel. So I value this relationship more than I can even tell you um, with AAKP and you make all of us better in the transplant community. So I just wanted to start by thanking you all for that. When Rachel and I put together these slides, I put up a slide of this picture. Does anybody know what this picture is? Oh, I heard somebody say it. It's the apotheosis of Washington. What is the apotheosis of Washington? It's when our first president of the United States was considered a god. I'm not making that up. Bermidi is the, the artist who did this right after the Civil War, and it's a beautiful, beautiful picture of our first president of the United States becoming a god. All right, come on, insert punchline here for our current administration, right? 
So that is literally, because I'm a literal person, <laughs> what is under the Capitol Dome. Okay, moving on, your moment of fun. So here's who we are. Um, I'll let, why don't I let Rachel jump in first so you know what she, who she is and who she represents before we dive into more of our presentation. Thanks, Peggy. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rachel Meyer, and I'm the Director of Policy and Government Affairs at the American Society of Nephrology. Uh, so like Peggy, I represent um, health professionals, nephrologists, scientists, uh, pharmacists, nurses, and other um, nephrology care professionals that are dedicated to leading the fight against kidney disease and really caring for everyone here in this room today. And like Peggy, I have such, um, I, I, I so value the relationship that we as ASN have with AAKP. They're who we turn to when we're trying to assess how should we come down on a position, how should we think about this issue from the patient perspective. And you know, working with Paul and Richard and, and many of you in this room is, uh, is it's, it's not only valuable in informing our principles, it's a lot of fun. All right, so, so is it the end of the love fest? <laughs> We love each other. Can you see that? We really like working with each other. Okay, we've beaten that one to death. So what are we here to do today? We want to talk to you about what it is we actually do and pieces of legislation that are going to impact you. Um, the easiest way to think about Capitol Hill is that oftentimes you're either going to love a piece of legislation and get behind it and be supporters of it, other times you're going to hate it and you're going to try to blow it up. Sometimes you do that compromising thing that Richard talked about in the middle where you try to make something better so it's not so ugly. Um, but we have two particular pieces of legislation we're going to talk about today. One we absolutely love and we're going full tilt on and another one we're trying to take down. Um, there are other pieces of legislation we're working on and we're very active in the transplant space. So back to Paul's comments. Congress is not sitting there painting their nails. It may feel like they're not getting anything accomplished, but that's a whole lot different from the work they're doing. They're doing a lot of work, and some of it is very good, and some of it is not so good. And the point and the purpose of what we do for a living is that we help your voice be amplified and the voice of the physicians and the surgeons be amplified so that Congress makes better decisions. So you can think what you like about lobbyists, but I consider myself an, an educator first and also an advocate. Um, at lunch yesterday, Patrick G. said to me, the be most beautiful definition of advocacy I'd ever heard, I've never heard anybody say it this way, but he was talking about how you're not just speaking for yourself and being your own advocate, but you're advocating for those people in that van. You're advocating for the people who couldn't make it here today because they're not well. That's what you're doing, that's what you're bringing to the public debate when you come to Capitol Hill, when you email, when you tweet, when you put something on Facebook, you're speaking for so many more people than just yourself. Did you want any other opening or do you want to dive I, into? I think let's dive in and tell you what it is we're actually working on in addition to having a lot of fun with one another. So, so Peggy and I have put together um, a list, as she said, of um, we are working on a whole spate of issues and we could probably spend the rest of the morning telling you all about them. We've hand selected a couple of bills, some of which we support and some of which we have some serious concerns about that AAKP also shares with ASTS and ASN. And we're gonna run through these with you today, but I think a theme that you're gonna hear and that you've already heard is that really a pillar of the advocacy work that ASTS and ASN do is, is being in partnership with patient organizations in general, but with AAKP in particular. So, um, why do we work together? Well, um, as physicians, we can bring the scientific credibility uh, of ASN, you know, we've got the journals, we've got the papers, we have the people who are doing the research and in the trenches, but that only really speaks to members of Congress when they understand from all of you in this room how that science can improve your life and how what we know about the best possible care can be translated into policy that will help improve your outcomes and the outcomes of your loved ones. So by partnering with you, we really amplify um, the messages that science can bring um, to policy. And without that, without you all in the room to put a face on it, to tell your members of Congress, this is how this is impacting me, uh, our messages tend to fall fairly flat when we're there on our own. I will say, when we at ASN are making decisions about how we're going to um, think about a particular piece of legislation or an issue that's recently cropped up in Capitol Hill, we ask three questions. The first question is, what is best for patients? 
And the second question is, what is best for the patient-physician relationship? And the third question is, what is best for the nephrologist and the specialty of nephrology overall? And we ask them in that order for very good reason. And typically, when we are starting to think about question number one, what is best for patients? Well, we don't sit there and come up with an answer ourselves, because our members aren't patients. They're physicians and they're scientists. We pick up the phone, we get on the horn, and we call Paul, and we call Richard. And we call many of you in this room to get your insights about how you're thinking about a particular policy. Because we want to make sure that um, you know, even if, you know, that, that what patients value and what they're looking for aligns with the science. So by bringing those two vantage points together, we at ASN feel that we are truly fulfilling our mission of leading the fight against kidney disease. Well said. Uh, so the how. Uh, I'll give you an example of in a fly-in. So, and it wasn't even a fly-in, it was just a Capitol Hill visit last week with my friend Richard. And we go in and we've got a very high level staffer who knows the issue cold. And you can feel this from another person. They're like, move on, you know, let's do it quick. I know what you're talking about, don't talk down to me. So I start running. And I'm like, okay, well, we need this, we need this, and you can help us here, and you can help us there. And, and Richard's just sitting there demurely as he does, not saying a word, right? And finally Richard says, um, can, I, can I add something? We're like, of course, Richard, you know, add something here. We've gone down all this back and forth, and he says, as a patient, and then the room got still, right? And then that staffer was wide-eyed. And it wasn't so much about just the machinations of policy, it was about the people. And Richard drove that home um, by talking about your friend Bill um, and his effort and his journey and his advocacy and what that meant. And he turned to her, looked her dead in the eye and said, these are the real people I'm talking about and this is the real impact on those people for what you're gonna help us do. And boom we had a meeting, right? I mean, if that gives you any kind of explanation of we need the policy, we need the background, we need to know the law, we need to have the great science and the research behind us, but the amplification came from the patient, patient's messages. So practically, what else do we do is we do joint statements, letters, press, you've heard about this. We also coordinate strategy. So oftentimes, if something comes out of left field with which God knows in the last year and a half, everything seems to have come from left field. Um, we are working with each other and calling each other and emailing each other and saying, what do you think about this? And what do we do about this? And what about the VA? And is this gonna help us or not help us? So there's this regular interaction and communication and coordination in the realm of transplant where we're helping each other out. Here's just an example of um, a couple of those letters. And why don't we then move quickly into the meat of some of the issues that we're working on. So diving into the Living Donor Protection Act, come on everybody, you have heard about this, right? You've heard about this, all right, you know what this is. In short, what this legislation is, is it's in two parts. The one part is not allowing insurance companies to discriminate against you all who are living donors. Um, because you have donated an organ. You're not unhealthier, so your life insurance, your disability, your supplemental insurance should not say to you, you cannot um, have my you know, product, you cannot have this insurance. So we're trying to make sure those insurance companies can't discriminate against you, part one. Part two of the bill is to reiterate and clarify in federal law that the Family Medical Leave Act, which most of you know, Family Medical Leave Act, you get to take time off from work, if you have a serious medical condition, that should include living donation. Of course it should. I'm pretty sure they still have to cut you open to get your kidney, right? That's pretty serious in my mind, okay? So we're working on that in the context of this bill and also outside the context of this bill to try to push the Department of Labor, who has jurisdiction over all of this, to say out loud, proud, and clear on their website when it's living donation, you can use Family Medical Leave Act. So we're in that process right now, and we've done a lot of different things um, to get noticed by the Department of Labor, and Paul's doing things I don't even want to tell you about, um, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, we've written letters, we've engaged members of Congress, we've engaged members of Congress, one of whom uh, was, um, had a child born with no kidneys at all, and her husband was a don uh, the living donor for her. And on Tuesday, I'm told, the House Appropriations Committee is going to introduce um, 
their legislation with some report language that we as a collective group have written that directs the Department of Labor to say, to go put something on their website really open and clear for everybody. So those who are considering being living donors can Google and say, well, what happens to me? Do I lose my job if I'm a living donor and I have to take time off from work? Well, no, there it is, right up on the Department of Labor's website you are covered. That's what we're after. That's what we're trying really hard to get. And we think that would be very valuable to get more kidneys in particular in the mix for the people who need transplants. Anything else on that? Did you want to add? Um, you know, Peggy, I think you said it well, but I'll just add a little personal note here that um, some of you heard and some of you haven't, which is uh, my uncle was actually um, a kidney patient. He is a kidney patient. He had kidney failure and needed a transplant. And the only way that anyone in my family was able to get him that kidney under current law, which as Peggy said, doesn't allow you to take time off of work, was to have my aunt, who fortunately is a school teacher, donate her kidney during the summer vacation. And if it hadn't been you know, the good fortune that her profession was being a teacher, my uncle would be on dialysis and hopefully he'd still be alive, but today he has a transplant because of that dumb luck, basically, that his yeah. match was a teacher. So I'm you know, personally motivated to work with um, Paul and Richard and Peggy and many of our other allies who are not at the table on this important legislation. And yeah. fingers crossed for Tuesday. Yeah, fingers crossed for Tuesday. So um, that I think will be helpful, but we'll, we're going to need to be louder and louder and do lots of things with the Department of Labor and others to make sure that happens. And so it isn't unclear anymore. Um, fun fact, I think, so I work at a law firm, I know, I already told you I was a lawyer. Richard tells people that all the time, it just, <laughs> stop it. I'm from Cleveland, too. I've made fun of on so many different levels. Anyway, so um, <laughs> so I have a lawyer at our, at our law firm, and I said, I need to know the background of the Family Medical Leave Act. Was there anything about organ donation in that conversation that those members had in Congress years and years ago when they were creating the Family Medical Leave Act? And this little genius lawyer at my firm found what we call a colloquy, which otherwise known as people talking to each other, on the floor of the House, where one member of Congress said, you know, I really care about living donation. Is this what's contemplated by serious medical condition under the Family Medical Leave Act? And the answer from the guy who was running the bill on the floor was, absolutely, that's what we meant. Yay, that's awesome. That was my silver bullet, right? So we stuck it in a legal memo and sent it over to the Department of Labor. And we're telling everybody about that. So did Congress have an intention or contemplate doing something? Damn right they did. And we have it in writing. And so that's the kind of way that a, that a law firm or research folk can bring more to the table that you can then use to advocate for a position we're trying to take or an action we want the agency or Congress to take for us. Well, I also think Peggy just made a really important point, which is our talk today is focusing about what's happening underneath the dome. But after Congress signs a law that we've all advocated for, the real work begins on the regulatory side. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we all collaborate sort of around the dome as well to make sure that what was put into law is correctly interpreted by the regulatory agencies and rolled out in a way that's most beneficial for patients. So um, as, as nice and tidy as it sounds when Congress passes a law, that's when real work begins for all of us. Well, let's not pretend that isn't real work, what we're doing. <laughs> that's the, yeah, it's, anyway, it's, it's real the work harder, on both sides. There you go. The harder work begins. Because the regulatory process, if you think about it, it's just the, it's the minutia. Yeah. It's the granularity. And boy, can they mess it up. If they don't hear from stakeholders like you and like our um, physicians and surgeons associations to say, no, 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 that's not how it works in the real world, Congress. Stop making stuff up. And the agencies, you can't just make stuff up. You got to listen to us. That's the whole point of that. So Living Donor Protection Act, if you haven't tried to get your members of Congress to support it, please do. We need more co-sponsors on it. That's the one where I talked earlier about things we really like. This is one we really like. Please support that bill. Shall we? On the other hand. Yes. Moving on to something we really collectively do not like, the Patients Act. So this is a bill that was first introduced in 2015, and I will say it has evolved since 2015, and uh, this, this gets to Richard's point, which is when we see something that we don't like, we don't just throw spitballs at it. We come forward collectively and individually as organizations uh, with suggestions for improvement and ways that something that we see as pretty negative could be made, not quite so, not quite so concerning. And many of the suggestions that ASTS and AAKP and ASN made were incorporated into this legislation over time. But unfortunately, 
um, the most significant concerns and suggestions for improvement that we uh, put forward were not integrated. So, you know, when although we like to be able to support things uh, in the service of doing what is best for patients, we sometimes have to put our foot down and say this is unacceptable. And the irony here, of course, is that this is called the Patients Act, and we do not believe it is what is best for patients. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about why. So, Go tell them what it does. Uh, so HR uh, 4143 S 2065 would essentially ask the um, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation to create a demonstration project, a testing a new way of delivering care that would permit large dialysis organizations, but probably not the small ones, to create organizations that uh, receive a capitated payment, which is to say they take over all of the care of a patient, not just the dialysis care, and they become responsible for 100% of the services that patients on dialysis need. Well, that kind of sounds okay on its surface, but when you get down into the weeds and into the nuance, which is what, 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 our, what our jobs basically are, there are some very concerning elements of this legislation. So you got the four key bullet points up on your screen here. I already mentioned that this is something that only the large dialysis providers would be able to do. And you know, we like to see some diversity in the market so that you all as patients have choices about where you get your dialysis care, that there are options out there. Yeah, first and foremost, I would hope with congressional legislation would be about giving you more options, um, not tying you into something that you, where you don't want to be. Uh, managed care, remember that word? Uh, we now call it coordinated care, so it doesn't sound so scary. But this, <laughs> right, uh, words. So um, really what this is, is managing your care. And so um, some of the, the big dialysis providers have said that coordinated care is so much better, and how could anybody oppose a bill where they're coordinating care? Well, you have to physically opt out of getting this kind of care. And for those of you who your first minutes on dialysis were a little foggy, I suppose, that's what I've heard. Um, yeah, right? I mean, being told like, okay, well you have to opt out of something. What does that mean? What is that? I don't know what I'm getting. I don't know what you're providing to me is not the way you normally do legislation. It makes more sense in a demonstration to let people have more choice and see if that demonstration actually works before you shove people into it. Um, that's a big problem. The other huge problem um, for the transplant community, of course, is that there is a giant disincentive, giant disincentive to push anybody out to transplant. What is that giant disincentive? Well, we did a back of the envelope math on this, and currently what these dialysis companies get to coordinate care is about $8,000 per patient per year. Now, this bill would make it eighty thousand dollars per patient per year. That's a 10 times increase in the payments, right? If that's not a financial incentive, I don't know what a financial incentive is. And that is when you're doing dialysis, not when you're doing transplant. So it didn't take us long to scratch our heads and say, well, that kind of financial incentive from eight to $80,000 per patient per year is huge and probably will make these dialysis companies want to keep you on dialysis, even though some of you may be great for transplant. So that again takes away your choices and that's part of the reason at least ASTS is strongly in opposition to this legislation. And I would add at, at ASN this uh, disincentive around transplantation is equally concerning. Two other aspects of the bill that are very problematic for our leadership. It really exacerbates the existing silos of care. So if you think about it, you know, Many people don't really know they have kidney disease or they don't get care before they go on dialysis. So you've got a chronic kidney disease silo here where more attention should be paid to identifying kidney disease earlier, to slowing the progression, to preventing the need for dialysis or transplant altogether. That's one little silo. You've got the dialysis providers and uh, you know, ESRD care is another sort of payment um, wedge. And then transplant over here, as mm -hmm. Peggy said, there's just no crosstalk or not enough crosstalk between the dialysis world and the transplant world. So what this legislation does is double down on creating a payment silo that is only focused on dialysis. It does not look upstream to identifying and preventing the progression of kidney disease. And as Peggy said, it doesn't really look at how do we incentivize more transplantation. Ideally, if you're designing a bill to do a better care delivery model, you would have something that spans all of those and aligns the incentives across them. I think the other thing that is problematic for us about this bill is that it potentially infringes on the patient-physician relationship. So if you're a doctor and you decide, 
you know, maybe I don't want to go be employed by this dialysis provider that's created this organization that's gobbling up all of the patients around, whether they like it or not. You may not be able to continue to see your patient in that dialysis unit. So, you know, the, the, the trusted patient physician relationship that is so important for continuity of care and doing what's best for you all, for the patients, is potentially broken apart by this demonstration yeah. project. So a little bit of David and Goliath here, right? So little transplant surgeon organization, um, AAKP and originally AST, we can't forget our friends at AST, which is another transplant association, started barking about this bill and telling the Hill, we don't, we don't like this bill and we think it has great problems with it, can you change the bill? And, and frankly, they didn't make the changes that we wanted and I don't think unless they remove those financial incentives entirely, we couldn't be supportive of the bill. So since that time, lots we have lots of other friends coming in. So the American College of Surgeons is the umbrella organization for all surgeons in the United States. They have now come out in opposition to this. The American Medical Association tomorrow is making a decision about whether or not they will come out against the Patients Act. There were insurance companies, because they already manage care. They don't need anybody else coming in to manage care for them, they think are going to join and help us oppose this bill, and the unions. The SEIU, if anybody knows the Service Employee International Union, have a lot of folks who are in, frankly, your di demographic, and they're very worried about how they're being treated by the big dialysis companies. So it's a strange bedfellows group, if you will, of folks, uh, kind of all of us against them, but we think our political power is gaining significantly because this bill was really dangerously and badly written and not written with the patient in mind. So we've got limited time, so I think we've got to run through, go to our VA bill. Back to something we like. Is this me? That, that's you? You, okay. Yeah. I mean, oh. So, <laughs> I don't know. So um, Veterans Administration, of course, right? So it's something else that it's very important because um, there are 13 transplant centers um, through the VA and they do transplants. And so we watch carefully to find out if they're doing things right for the VA or not doing things right for the Veterans Administration. And recently there were a couple of bills in the, in the last couple of years, the Choice Act you might have heard of and the Mission Act. And what these bills are trying to do is give veterans more options for transplant. So they didn't have to just go to these 13 centers. Maybe they can go to other places that were going to be better for them. There was another bill called the Victor Bill, and that the basic premise of that bill is that there was a patient in Texas whose son said, I'm a perfect match, I can be your living donor dad, and he was not a veteran. The son was not a veteran. The father was a veteran. And the VA in that particular facility said, nah, we don't need your kidney. What? So that got Congress's attention, and a bill was written by Representative Carter out of Texas saying, that ain't okay. You got a matching kidney, you go for it, it's within family lines. Of course, that's what we should do that. And so we all jumped on and supported the um, VTCA, VCTA, I always get that wrong, um, bill. My dyslexia is showing, I guess. Um, we supported that bill. And then when the mission bill came up and the Victor Act came up, isn't it cute, all these acronyms? Who is, where's Mike? He was laughing about acronyms early. Sorry, we do acronyms in Washington. Um, the Victor Act was something where we took a look at it and on its face, it seems like a great idea. Thank God we had Ed Hickey in the room because we're like, well, this looks fine to us. And Paul pulls in Ed Hickey and goes, are you kidding? Do you know the VA? <laughs> The VA won't do this right until we tell them how to do it right. So we can't be supporting a bill where we're just going to let them wing it over at the VA. And having experts like you is critical to what we do. So we went in and said, okay, we like this one bill, but as far as Victor goes, you better talk to us. And it was a really strong letter saying, we're not going to support your bill because you need to talk to us. And what we're, how we're aligning ourselves right now is to go in and have those visits, White House administration, all the ones Richard was talking about earlier, so we don't just stop at the law passed and was signed into law on Wednesday. We're gonna keep going on this VA bill because we wanna make sure those who have served us, the greatest generation and beyond, are getting the kind of care they need. Um, whether it's through dialysis or transplant or both, and certainly through transplant. So we're not gonna stop on that. As Rachel said earlier, that regulatory process, things could, you know, you have a great bill over here and then the regulatory process mucks it up. We're not gonna stop. We're gonna keep working to make sure the VA does this right. So we think that was also an important bill, an important effort that we'll be continuing um, on your behalf. So if other Ed Hickeys live out there, please help us with your expertise on the VA. Thank you. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about some of our efforts related to things on the regulatory side. I guess we organized our slides well, didn't we, Peggy? Are um, we good at that? So, so I'm going to talk briefly. How many people in this room um, dialyze more than three times per week or do dialysis at home or have a loved one who does? A good number of you out there. So. Um, we are deeply concerned by a recent proposal from these local Medicare contractors who kind of pay the bills for Medicare at the local level. They recently came forward with a proposal that said, anyone who wants to dialyze more than three times per week, we're not going to pay for it. We're just not going to pay for it. They didn't really have any great evidence about why they weren't going to pay for it. And, you know, as you all know, there is an overwhelming amount of evidence about the benefits of more than thrice weekly dialysis. And for the physicians who we represent, having that ability to work with you all as patients to determine what is the best modality and what is the best frequency for your health is critically important. So this really lit a fire under our leadership when this proposal mm -hmm. came through. Um, and we have been working um, at the local level with all of those Medicare contractors, sending howlers and working with AAKP to make sure that you all as patients are also sending howlers to them to say that this is unacceptable. But we're also taking it a step further because actions like this that are not evidence-based, that restrict patient choice, that restrict your ability to do what you want to do with your physician are unacceptable. So we've gone to Congress in partnership with a host of other organizations who are also facing a similar challenge. And we've gotten legislation introduced, the Local Coverage Determination Act, that would crack down on these rogue Medicare contractors who don't use evidence, who don't talk to patients, and who don't talk to physicians when we say these things are important and you need to pay attention. So what this bill would basically do is open up the local coverage decisions um, to more transparency, to more patient and health professional input, and it would also create um, a sort of pathway to formally register complaints about decisions so that if we don't like what they decide at the local level, we can go up to HHS Secretary Azar and register a complaint and have a new set of eyes on the evidence about why more than thrice weekly dialysis is in many cases the best option and we should be doing more of it, we should be paying for more of it, not paying for less of it. Um, right. So. We've got a couple of other quick topics to cover, but um, both Rachel and I have to jump on planes, so I want to leave a little time for some questions. So I'm just going to buzz through these slides. I'm sure they can sure. be sent to you um, if you see them. But as far as regulatory relief, it's very burdensome on the physicians to have to follow a whole bunch of standards that are set up by a bunch of different agencies. We're trying to streamline that. That's basically what that first part of this slide says. And then moving on, um, Rachel, if you can just say a sentence or two sure about thing. each of these, I think. So uh, I think a lot of the work that ASN and AKP have done in partnership is advocating for more funding for kidney research. You're all going to hear uh, Rob Starr from the NIDDK talk later about the Kidney Precision Medicine Project. Um, it's promising initiatives like this that Richard is also very involved in that are the reason that we go to Capitol Hill and say you need to invest in kidney research so that you're not just spending $34 billion a year paying for care that isn't meaningfully improving patients' lives year over year. Yesterday, uh, many of you heard Sandeep Patel from the Department of Human Ser Services talk about uh, Kidney X, this new public-private partnership with ASN to foster more innovation, more bringing of products to you as patients. ASN has committed the first $25 million to this public-private partnership, and now we're turning to our friends on Capitol Hill to say it's your turn to fill the public part of that partnership and commit an additional $25 million in new funding to help build on that good work that NIH does and translate new products that can, can benefit everyone in this room. So I think okay. we'll uh, click on here. With that said, we go back to our God, Washington. I also learned when I was digging this up that there are a couple of the maidens surrounding him that are supposed to represent the 13 colonies. There are a few turned away from him because this was painted during the Civil War. Isn't that cool? And the ones that were turned away, and I don't know which states they are, were the states that turned away from the Union. What a geek. I'm sorry. That was nerdy. You guys see what I mean? The exciting, the exciting ones. Listen, um, we, we, we really want to thank you. Um, for that presentation and sharing with us. So guys, everybody needs to understand that we're all part of the team, the role that we play in helping them help us and us helping ourselves. And um, we're real excited about the future because we believe that we have a formula that works well. I'm gonna ask my colleague, Paul Conway, to come back up. I think we want to take some questions. Any, are well, any questions yeah. out questions there? Well, yeah, There's I still want him to come back up because he can no, help answer the questions. No, we don't want him questions. back up here. Um, <laughs> but let's... Um, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, it's, Let's it's have cool. some questions. 
Look. Here's, there's a mic up here. There's a mic over here. Please, the, line up right here. Let, let's be honest. The real reason we don't want Paul up here is he has better hair than all of us. <laughs> and, uh, there's, there's a great Billy Joel Pompadour story about that uh, song. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Uh, I wondered if you could advise which politicians or congressmen are supporting the Patients Act in case we want to contact them. I, that is such a great question, and I think we'd be happy to send a list around to everyone. Unfortunately, the list of people who have supported the Patients Act is longer than we'd like it to be. We think this is probably a case of not having the right facts and information at hand. I think maybe folks have been a little misled, but um, it would be terrific if you'd reach out to your members of Congress and others, and I know AAKP has a lot of resources to help you do just that. If I mention one name, I mean, I know who my congressman, would you know if he was one that supported Maybe. or not? Maybe. Test us. Jody Heiss in, in Georgia. I don't know off the top of my head, but you, we could probably look it up. Because he's very quickly. accessible and very probably has phone calls, town hall meetings, and... Yeah, okay. congress.gov, congress and if you put in the bill number, we'll give you the bill number, then they'll yeah, list the co-sponsors, yeah. and you can pull that right up. Okay. Um, but the message to them, if they have signed on to the bill, is, I'm so sorry you signed on to the bill. We think it has a lot of problems. Can you either take your name off or try not to move that bill? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Next. Yeah. All right, there's going to be a fight. It's a brawl. Okay. All right. Come on. So, hi. Excellent. I, um, I spent a few years in your world. I, I did legislative work for FDA during Purdue for Five and uh, pharmacy compounding fiasco, 21st Century Cures early work. So, fun times. I know from experience, you guys are pros. Yeah. Um, put, put the three of you and Paul together. It's like legislative nephrology Avengers. We need like capes for you all. Oh my God, my husband. I can't go home to him. My head's gonna be too big. No, it's, it's true. I uh, uh, honesty before kindness. It's it's true. Um, so similar to to the previous question, uh, but but a different tack. So. If you've got you know, kind of the nephrology Avengers, you've got SEIU, possibly AMA, surgeons, big hitters, who's on the other side? What groups are talking into the congressman's ears that are convincing them that this awful bill is, is something good? Being, I hope, adorably agnostic, I will say that, uh, maybe not so adorable, but anyway, DeVita wrote the bill and advanced the bill. Okay. Fresenius came on afterwards, okay. and U.S. Renal is supportive. And the renal physicians are not pushing this bill, but they have come out with kind of soft support for it. Mm. And then the patient's organization that is known to be the DeVita's patient organization is also in support of it. If that tells you anything. Yeah, it tells me everything. All right. You guys got a big fight in your hands. Was I adorable and agnostic? I tried. You're just fantastic okay. always. <laughs> okay, good luck. We'll do our part. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Well, Steve Feiderman from Houston. I have a, uh, an idea that might work. I, I recognize that the Dialysis Patient Act is really a LDO Patient Act. And I mean, I think that's relatively obvious. But the concept, were it not an LDO, it's like having a barbershop control haircuts. I mean, Beautiful. If you have a dialysis company controlling whether patients go on to dialysis or a transplant, of course they're going to push dialysis, just like having a hospital do it, it's mm -hmm. going to push hospitalizations. And uh, just like if, AST, if the transplant organization was doing it, it, it would have its downside too. True. What about maybe modifying the bill that the LDO is a player, but they're not in control, and a nonprofit organization be established that has uh, stakeholders throughout the community, including patients, that can govern what happens to patients and uh, let them be the management organization. The reason I say that is healthcare is not very well coordinated. And uh, a lot of patients at stage two and stage three don't really get the benefits. And, and the only time they actually get any kind of introduction to transplant or anything else is when they're on dialysis and if we could go upstream Amen. it would win but i don't want the people going upstream to go upstream with a net for dialysis i want them to go upstream in a way that they can coordinate the modalities better so i swear i've never met this man before i did not plant him here <laughs> But, but my association is taking the lead on exactly what you just described, which is a whole bunch of stakeholders coming in in the transplant space to make decisions about how best to get people out of dialysis where appropriate 
to transplant. Yeah. So we're writing a model that will probably be legislation in the next six months, if not the next session, on exactly what you just said. So that's that's where we're going. Well, then you guys are in the right direction because if we could come up with a competing bill that would be more patient-centered, I think yeah. we would Amen. have a better chance of it getting passed. Yep, and a, a pivotal part of that legislation is the patient involvement, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank and, you. And I recognize what, and I want to say something that might be controversial to some. I know you guys have this idea about the VA and everything, but let me tell you, the VA rocks. It, oh, we love the VA. Yeah. Everyone up and, here, we're doing this work because we and, think the VA does the transplant does programs, yep. I'm involved in yeah. one of the transplant programs at the VA. And I can tell you, I mean, if there are minor problems with LD, you know, living donors and stuff like these can be worked out. But I can tell you the transplant outcomes at our VA versus some of the hospitals are just outstanding. It's a fair yeah. point. I'm glad you mentioned yeah. that. So okay. well, and, we will and, and, we'll make sure to be the watchdogs that we are, but also try to be helpful. And right. one more note on the, uh, the care delivery model, because I think you really are highlighting such an important point. On the regulatory side, we at ASN are actually working on proposing a model that would, as I said, span chronic kidney disease, dialysis, and transplantation so that we're aligning the incentives for physicians to do the right thing for patients and provide continuity of care throughout the patient journey. So that's something we're looking to move through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation in the coming months here. Yeah, we really have to go upstream. Thank we you agree. very much. Okay, thanks. Um, while I want to, st one more question. Yeah, um, while I want to stay here and be in sunny Florida, I have to go back, and Rachel and I have to go back to rainy Washington. It's raining the again. Swamp. The swamp. It is the swamp, you know, at least from a climate standpoint. So but let's take one more one question more, one from more Kevin question, here. Please. Yeah, no, just, one is just to say thanks. I think it's, it's impressive to see Sorry. ASN, ASTS, AAKP, and then AST is also many times right, working together. Yep. So it shows the power. So I just want to make sure that all of us as patients make sure we leave here with a very clear to-do list. Yeah. And then the other thing I would just say too is that really to solve the issue is moving everything upstream. Yep. My request is let's make sure we have patients embedded in this process. So this is designed with patients for patients, Amen. not LDOs. Amen. Thank yes. you. Well said. Thank you. Okay. Big hand. And one last thing before they run. Uh, I tell you what, it's a special uh, honor for us. Uh, we like to honor our allies, and it means a great deal to us. So we'd like to present to uh, both Rachel and Peggy our uh, National Congressional Advocacy Award uh, on behalf of the American Association of Kidney Patients. Please give them a round. All right, you guys, thank you very much. We'll take a break right now. And then in the breakout sessions, please look at your schedule. There are two fantastic breakout sessions. Uh, we're honored to have NIDDK here, uh, Robert Starr. Thank you very much.